Becca. This is Molly. We're here to talk about Jane Austen. We're here to talk about some really exciting chapters of Jane Austen. This is like the mush section of Pride and Prejudice. Very mushy. It's obviously been a tough couple months for us all at this point in time. But good news for us, as Pride and Prejudice wraps up, things get sappy and lovely. It's so sweet and just living vicariously through these ladies. Oh my gosh. There's a lot to talk about here. For listeners who are joining us for the first time, I, Becca, have read a lot of Jane Austen books. Molly has never read any Jane Austen books, but she is getting very close to finishing her first which is Pride and Prejudice. I'm so excited. I was talking to my friend last night. We were watching Star Wars over Zoom because I'm a nerd. That's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And she was like, so wait, you've never read any Jane Austen books, but now you have. And I was like, now I almost have. Yes. You're you're like like five chapters or six chapters from the end. It's like wild. Oh my God. We're so close to finishing. I know. Wow. So something has to wrap up soon because otherwise we're... (laughs) <laughs> you know? I do. Well, right now we're reading chapters 12 and 13 of volume the third and a pretty specific plot point we've been following since chapter one wraps up in these chapters. And it's so, there's this one moment where, well, we can get into it. Yes. Yeah. Let's just get into it. Let's talk about what happens here. So to recap from last episode, Lydia has married Wickham, which was a rough choice, but she doesn't seem to understand it's a rough choice. They've moved north, and we found out that Darcy loves Lizzie enough to make sure that Lydia and Wickham got married by paying off all of Wickham's debts, despite the fact that Wickham is his sworn enemy. Very cute. But also, in doing so, ruins his chances with Lizzie because he's not going to want to be Wickham's brother-in-law. I don't think, anyway. Yes. And also, on the other side of that, we had. Bingley and Darcy returning to Longbourn. And being super awkward about it. Yeah, they were just messes. It's so cute. And so now we're going to talk about chapters 12 and 13. So in chapter 12, the boys leave after visiting and being awkward messes. And Lizzie just can't stop thinking about Darcy's behavior and wondering like why he was being so weird because he had kind of done a 180 and been cool. When she had last seen him and mm-hmm. he was nice to everyone. Now he's being awkward and kind of cold again. Yeah. And she's like, why would he even come if he's just going to be that way? Lizzie was all of us talking about interacting with our crush in that moment. Uh, what was it she said? She says, oh, he could be still amiable, still pleasing to my uncle and aunt when he was in town. And why not to me? If he fears me, why come hither? If he no longer cares for me, why silent? Teasing, teasing, man. I will think no more of him. I also was thinking about like the first line of this, which is just, Lizzie walked out to recover her spirits, or in other words, to dwell without interruption on those subjects that must deaden them more. Lizzie's catchphrase is, sorry, gotta go overthink this a little bit. She just sits in the corner being like, okay, what exactly did my crush say and do? Which is so funny, because if you remember, she just lived at baseline Darcy's being shitty I don't care why for so long when he was trying so hard to seduce her he was trying so hard he did such a bad job and now every single moment of her time with him is like what did this one movement mean yeah exactly (laughs) so same so then Jane comes over and talks to her and she's like that was great. Now that I've seen Bingley once, I'm fine. <laughs> We're going to be totally cordial to each other, totally indifferent. And Lizzie's like, okay, Jane, sure, Jane. And Jane is offended <laughs> because she thinks that Lizzie thinks she's weak. And she says something like, you cannot think me so weak as to be in danger now. And Lizzie's like, I think you're in danger of making him fall as in love with you as ever. And it's pretty cute. And Jane's like, whatever. Jane is going on this whole like, no, this is great. We're going to be friends. Yeah, Jane is so in denial. but. Also, like, I don't believe her for a second, you know? Nobody believes her for a second. Oh, yeah, no, you you can't. But she also, like, she's trying because she genuinely believes she doesn't have a shot at this point in time. Yeah. She's like, I'm not in love with him, so it doesn't matter. No chance. No way. I won't say it. Oh, no. It's too cliche. No, no, stop singing because Disney will take us for all you're of right, our money. Right. Yeah, Disney <laughs> is definitely listening to our podcast. <laughs> exactly. Disney, if you'd like to come on this podcast, we're happy to have you. Yeah, except Disney kind of sucks. But... Yeah, but but the, I, I meant the general concept of Disney, not Walt Disney himself. He's theoretically dead. Baby Yoda, come on the podcast. This is taking a turn. Let's get back into the, the pride and the prejudice. So they're invited over for dinner on Tuesday for a large party. And so everyone comes over and... And Bingley and Darcy, 
to the credit of their punctuality as sportsmen, are very on time. And I just, <laughs> at this point, I think we've heard enough that they're like sportsmen, but I still can't picture these two awkward, stupid boys being good at any sport, even if it's like croquet. I think they are good at the repressed sports for sure. Yeah. But I like that you just wrote literally the least sporty people because yes. <laughs> Like wearing their little heeled boots. Oh my God. Anyway. Well, what I was going to say is, I saw this in your notes later. Dinner in this time period does mean lunch. So what I'm picturing here is like basically brunch. Ooh, I want brunch. Great. Okay, so they're over for brunch. And Bingley sits by Jane, which makes Lizzie very happy. And then she looks over to see what Darcy thinks about it. And Darcy is like kind of stone faced, like not making any expressions. I'm kind of confused what she thinks. Like, does she think that he's changed his mind? and given Bingley his permission, does she think that he hasn't? She doesn't know what's happening because she can't read him. Okay. I also think there was a cute moment here where Bingley was like nervous and then Jane smiled at him and he just kind of was like, okay. Yeah, there's an empty seat next to Jane. He walks into the cafeteria. He looks around awkwardly holding his tray. He sees Jane. Jane turns, gives him a smile and then he goes, okay. And he sits down and then Darcy sits down next to the only other available seat, which is next to Mrs. Bennett. And Lizzie notes that this will not give either of them any pleasure, which is beautiful. I want to reiterate, remember how rude Mrs. Bennett was to Darcy? Yes. And she continues to be rude to him at this meal. Yes. And it's very uncomfortable for everybody. Especially for Lizzie, who knows that Mr. Darcy saved their lives. And then she says this really cute thing. It says, she would at times have given anything to be privileged to tell him that his kindness was neither unknown nor unfelt by the whole of the family. She just wants to tell him that she's thankful. She wants to do more than just tell him she's thankful. She wants to show him that she's thankful. She kind of is just hoping the whole time for a moment alone with him. And she hopes that maybe after dinner or brunch, the men go to smoke and then they come back into the drawing room. She's hoping that that'll be her moment to talk to him. And she vows that if he doesn't come to her, then she will give him up for good, which is so silly. Of course, you're not going to give him up for good, Lizzie, but whatever. But then the girls are all gathered closely around the tea things and they're like making tea and coffee and someone, and it doesn't even say who, like leans over to Lizzie and is like, the men shan't come and part us. I am determined. We want none of them, do we? Why are they doing a girls only thing over here? Well, remember that Catherine de Berg did that. Sorry. Catherine de Berg at Rosings. And oh, it's been a while since Catherine de Berg has made it into the podcast because yeah. I haven't said her name in a bit, but it's just like girl time it's sort of a girl's rule boy's rule sort of situation that's annoying also i want to be clear when i say this is like brunch dinner does mean lunch i just feel like the party i'm picturing is like a sunday brunch party for sure yes it is a tuesday but well they don't have weekends because they're all like the upper class you're right their lives are quarantined like time doesn't matter right but who is this girl? I don't know. It's like a big party. Maybe it's a Lucas. Could be a Lucas. Could be a... Could be Mrs. Long. Long. <laughs> Could be Kitty. Who's to say? It's probably not Kitty. Kitty always wants boys yeah, there. Yeah, definitely. So Lizzie's just like watching him the whole time and she gets jealous of him talking to other people. She envies everyone whom he deigns to speak words to. And then she's like, Fuck, stop it, Lizzie. Uh. Can we talk about the fact that Lizzie and Love is so fucking sappy? Lizzie and Love is so sappy. She's so sarcastic and spiky when she's making fun of others or like noticing others. But when she's feeling her own feelings, she is so soft. She's like, I just want to talk to him. Why does everybody else get to talk to him and not me? I know. It's actually so fucking cute. And Darcy, I can imagine, is kind of the same way. Like, I'm realizing now he hasn't gotten a chance to, like, give her a real proposal. You mean proposal again didn't really do the trick? It didn't really do the trick. It was kind of mean. <laughs> And I really want him to have a chance to just, like, say all of the kind things that I know are swirling around in his stupid boy brain. Yeah. Wow. Imagine how good he would be at it if he could, like, write down his proposal and read it to her. Much better. We've learned that Darcy just needs to think things through before he says them out loud. Darcy, you're right. Good. So back to this. She gets mad at herself for being jealous because she thinks it would, you know, like, why would she think that he would propose to her again? Nobody would ever propose twice. That would be so embarrassing. So he comes over to put his coffee cup away and she's like, now's my chance. So she asks about Georgie 
and then they have a brief interaction about Georgie and then they just stand there in silence and she thinks to herself that like I can't think of anything to say I'll leave it up to him he'll think of something to say which is so stupid because he's Darcy it's also so them do you remember when he went to visit her when she was staying with the Collinses and he was like sitting there just silently and finally trying to figure out something to say I almost made Molly spit out her coffee (laughs) I took Becca speaking as a break to take a sip of coffee and then she brought that up (laughs) (laughs) just like it's very on brand for Darcy to not know how to talk to Lizzie and back when Lizzie didn't give a shit about what Darcy thought she would just sit there and she wouldn't care she would just be like yeah remember when they danced and he couldn't think of anything to say and she was like well it's your turn are you gonna say anything to me or not yeah now she's like um uh how's your sister how's Georgie is she is she lonely I, I imagine her friends are no longer there um yes well um Yes. And then they just stand there. And then Darcy just walks away. He just turns around and walks away. (laughs) Because that's also a very Darcy move to do. Oh, entirely. For the first like three months he knew Elizabeth Bennet, all he would do was stand near her. Yes. Instead of talking to her. Yes. Like the vampire stalker that he is. Exactly. Then it's time for cards. And Darcy falls victim to her mother's rapacity, which means aggressive greed for whist players and so Lizzie's like well there goes the night and he's like sitting over with her mom and she's sitting playing different cards and the only thing that gives her any sort of comfort is that she keeps looking over at him and he's looking over at her and neither of them are playing very well so they they both lose because they were staring at each other the whole time so basically they are flirting what disaster horny fucks like honestly they're like flirting with their eyes but not knowing how to do anything about it exactly and Mrs. Bennett really wants them both to stay for supper, which is where I asked if dinner was lunch, and now I understand. But they leave too early. And Mrs. Bennett is then talking about how she thinks everything went really well. Even Darcy complimented the food. And then she tells Jane that Mrs. Long said that she was certain we'd see Jane at Netherfield at last. So fun fact here, Mrs. Bennett notes that Darcy probably has, quote, two to three French cooks. Yes. English food at the time even, was like less class A than uh, French food. Mm. French food was at the time the peak of cuisine. I think we can all now acknowledge that lots of other cuisines bring about lots of other really lovely, delectable food. But it's like specifically Mrs. Bennett made a French dish or had her chefs make one. And yeah, they had um, a haunch. What's a haunch? Like a thigh? I think it was a pastry. Partridge. They had partridge. What's a partridge? Partridge is a bird. They had a bird. You're right. And a partridge in a pear tree. So they had little birds for brunch. So like you can see that Mrs. Bennett's trying to impress them with French cooking as opposed to English cooking. Got it. Anyway, just a little fun fact. And then she talks about how Miss Long said the thing about Jane going to Netherfield at last. And then that's very exciting to her. She's so excited that she gets her expectations up a little bit too high in true Mrs. Bennett fashion and she's disappointed when they don't come and propose the next day. You know what I love the most about Mrs. Bennett is that she has aggressive short-term memory loss. Like, she'll get so upset about something, but the moment that something goes, like, the right way again, she'll forget about the bad thing. Like, it happened with Lickum and now it's happening with Jingli. Yeah, it's about to hardcore happen. She's about to forget all about Lydia and Wickham, too. Oh, yeah. She already did the minute that they got married. She was like, oh, good. And forgot about the bad stuff there exactly jane and lizzie get a chance to talk to each other then and jane says to lizzie that she thinks it went very well and she really liked the company that everyone was keeping and she hopes that they'll have the same group over again very soon and lizzie smiles at this and jane is like shut up (laughs) like stop smiling at me and she's like i've seen now that bingley is just always that nice that's just how he is so we're good we're good she's always just saying we're good everything's fine yeah jane is the quintessential this is fine i'm fine yeah she's that house on fire this is fine this is fine yeah and then lizzie is like okay if you're gonna tell me not to smile at it then you just can't talk to me about bingley anymore because i don't believe a word that you're saying basically and that's the end of that chapter yes it is so then we move on to chapter 13 aka jane gets what she deserves yes at long last yes (laughs) bingley comes again to call on them alone Darcy has gone for 10 days and I wrote (laughs) it said Bingley called again and alone and I circled alone and then it says his friend had left him that morning and I wrote no and then it said but was to return home in 10 days time and then I wrote phew (laughs) (laughs) I'm 
was really stressed that he was gone. You were not good. You were not okay for a moment. I was not. That's the last we see Mr. Darcy in the book. <laughs> Jokes. So Mrs. Bennett invites him to come for dinner that night, that afternoon, I guess. But he can't. So she says maybe next time we'll be more lucky. And <laughs> she's totally flirting with him on behalf of Jane. She's like, please come over. Come hang out with us. My mom does this shit all the time. Inviting boys that you want to date to dinner? No, just like being like loud and hinty with guys. Like, oh, you know. Yeah. You know, you know. Mrs. Bennett. God. Anyway, it works. I'm into this look on Mrs. Bennett, though, because I feel like at this point in time, we're all like aware of what Bingley's doing. Right. Exactly. And Mrs. Bennett, she has no like she has no chill. But I feel like there's a little bit of a. <laughs> you know who else has no chill? Bingley. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bingley has zero chill. Like none at all. They work out well. And she tells him, oh, well, will you come tomorrow then? And he's like, yes, I will. Very excitedly. So he comes the next day so early that none of them are even dressed yet. So Mrs. Bennett runs upstairs and she's like, oh my God, get Jane, get ready, get dressed. Bingley is here. And then she tells her servant, get Jane ready. Don't worry about Lizzie's hair. It's fine. It's fine. Oh my God. And she's like, it just matters that Jane looks good. So the way I picture that is that like the servant is literally halfway through doing Lizzie's hair and that she walks, she bursts through. She's like, Jane needs to be ready. Put down Lizzie's hair. She can finish it herself. Exactly. And Lizzie's like, uh, okay. And They're like, okay, well, mom, you know, Kitty already went upstairs like half an hour ago. And she goes, hey, Kitty, what does Kitty have to do with it? I feel like Kitty is such a punching bag in this family. She really is. Hashtag free Kitty. Free Kitty. I want her to find a good lover. Jane won't go downstairs without her sister, without at least one of them. So she's like, mom, please calm down. Yeah, Jane has all the chill. Jane has all the chill. Bingley has no chill. Mrs. Bennett has no chill. Lizzie has no chill at this point, honestly. And you know who has a monopoly on the chill? Who? Mr. Daddy Bennett. Bennett. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So they all go down and have tea together. And Mr. Bennett afterwards, Mr. Bennett and Mary both go off to read separately. Mary goes to go practice her instrument badly. So then it's just the four of them, I guess, including Bingley. It said that two of the five obstacles have been removed in <laughs> Mrs. Bennett's mind. So Mrs. Bennett keeps like winking at Lizzie and Kitty. And Kitty's like, what? Kitty's like, mom, what are you doing? Do you have something in your eye? And she's like, no, 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 no. And then she's like, Kitty, I got to talk to you. So Mrs. Bennett and Kitty go into the hallway and then it's just Jane, Lizzie and Mr. Bingley. And Jane, as soon as Mrs. Bennett and Kitty are gone, she like glares at Lizzie like, you are not getting up and leaving me alone with him because she still doesn't think she has a chance. She thinks that Mrs. Bennett is being very like overstepping. Embarrassing. embarrassing. And then Mrs. Bennett comes back in and she's like, Lizzie, I have to talk to you. And so Lizzie goes to talk to her and she's like, Kitty and I are going to go upstairs. And Lizzie is like, okay. And then they go and then she goes back into the room. So Mrs. Bennett was unsuccessful in this moment nothing else happens that day there is like a lot of lizzie third wheeling jane and bingley yes in this chapter and for some reason lizzie doesn't feel weird about it but i think what my head canon is on this and something that i think is pretty heavily implied in the books is that lizzie and bingley get along really well they're bros i love this for them they are such bros they get along and you get the sense that like they really enjoy each other's company in like a platonic manner yeah so like It is kind of not weird that they're all there because, you know, Lizzie gets along with everybody. Especially if he's about to be her brother because the next day, (laughs) segue, the next day, Bingley is invited to come shoot in the morning with Mr. Bennett. And Jane, from this point forward, says nothing of her indifference. Lizzie is certain that they're going to get married soon unless Darcy comes back and stops it. But she doubts that he would. She's still confused about that, which is annoying because I think that she can think better of Darcy than that. Anyway, Bingley comes the next morning and shoots with Daddy Bennett, and Daddy Bennett loves him. And it it talks about how he comes out of his shell that he's always in, and he's, like, talking and laughing and hanging out with Bingley and loving him. Honestly, who doesn't want to be on that hunting trip? I would love to, and I'm vegan. Oh, man. It's, It's so easy to crush on Bingley in these chapters, too. Yeah, oh, he's so sweet. So Lizzie goes during this time to go write a letter 
So she's not there to counteract Mrs. Bennett's schemes of getting Jane and Bingley alone. And she goes back to the drawing room after her letter is done, and she accidentally walks in on Jingli alone, standing close together over the hearth. And Make it out! No, they weren't making out, but I really want them to have been making out. They were in earnest conversation. Even hotter. Yeah. <laughs> and Lizzie, like, freezes in the doorway, and everyone stares at each other for a minute very uncomfortably, and then Bingley just runs out of the room, pulling a full-on Darcy. Being a disaster and awkward after professing love is absolutely pulling a Darcy. Yeah. Oh, but just running away in general. Exactly. <laughs> then Jane runs up to Lizzie, and she tells her she's been made the happiest woman in the world. She says it's too much that she could be this happy. Why isn't everyone in the world this happy? And she's just... Jane. Did your heart sing when you read that line? Yeah, I almost cried. I was like, oh, at last. And also just that her first thought, instead of like being like, this is so exciting for me. She's like, why isn't everyone this happy? And she's so excited to go tell everyone about it because she knows it's going to make them so happy. And she's just so good. God bless Jane Bennett. Honestly, the least problematic character ever written. Yeah, just, just good. Just just a good person. We just stand, and this chapter is when Jane gets what she deserves. At last. At last. And Lizzie is so happy, and Jane runs off to tell everyone. And Lizzie, I liked this moment. I'll read it out loud. Elizabeth, who was left by herself, now smiled at the rapidity and ease with which an affair was finally settled that had given them so many previous months of surprise and vexation. And this, said she, is the end of all his friends' anxious circumspection, of all his sister's falsehood and contrivance, the happiest, wisest, and most reasonable end. That Jane and Bingley... Getting married. Are gonna get married. Oh, finally. They're engaged. They're engaged. <laughs> Yay. So happy. So happy. I'm so sorry that Graham has to hear that little squeal that I just did. I know. <laughs> That's my jingly squeal. Because they're so cute. We all have a jingly squeal. They're so freaking sweet. And then we get to see Bingley and Lizzie being bros because Bingley like runs in and he's like, where's your sister? And she's like, she went upstairs. And then he comes in and he and Lizzie have this cute little moment where they're talking about how they're going to be so happy as brother and sister. And Lizzie tells him that she knows they're going to be very happy because they're so similar. And, and she notices that they both have the same feelings towards each other. Like he's just as in love with Jane as she is with him. And it's just warming Lizzie's heart. I like to think that Bingley is like skipping around the Bennett house at this point in time you know what i mean yeah oh man we all just need this in our life oh my god listeners like you can't see this but molly and i are both like grinning right now yeah. it's like really nice and, um, <laughs> everyone's just happy and then bingley leaves for the day and daddy bennett tells jane that she'll be very happy and then he has a weird daddy bennett moment oh oh read the quote we this is actually pretty famous oh really yeah because I wrote it down. Yes. So this is just so weird. He's like, Jane, you're going to be really happy. You are a good girl, and I have great pleasure in thinking you will be so happily settled. I have not a doubt of your doing very well together. Your tempers are by no means unlike. You are each of you so complying that nothing will ever be resolved on. So easy that every servant will cheat you and so generous that you will always exceed your income. That just took a turn. It was like, it started out being like, you're so good together. You're so kind. You're both so similar. You're gonna never let anything get done your servants are gonna steal from you and you're gonna always be in debt but they'll always be happy that's sort of the point is that like yeah they're gonna be so nice to everyone that they're gonna be untouched by the bad things in the world you know what i mean and they will always be happy together we talked about this towards the very beginning of the podcast but jane and bingley as a couple are one of those weird combo sunshine couples they're both so sunny and sweet oh yeah we did talk about this yeah i remember thinking then they can't be together because they're too sunny and sweet but they can the world can take a couple this sweet they can and jane's first response to that was like no like matters of money i'll never let myself go into debt and mrs bennett is like no, Bingley has four or five thousand a year. They're going to be fine. So she's like talking about his money still. We talked about this a little bit. He's like new money, right? He's not that rich. Bingley's the son of a tradesman. So he's like new money in society. But he's like he's broken up through the ranks a little bit. So he's got a lot of funding. And Jane is like a poor daughter of a gentleman. So together they're like set. Nice. So Mrs. Bennett is talking about how she knew it all along she knew that everything would work out fine she knew that jane wasn't so beautiful for nothing and wickham and lydia are all forgotten now mrs bennett's favorite daughter is jane without a doubt and 
she's just that short term memory is it's doing its work. Right We're going to talk about this a bit more in the study questions, but this is like everything Mrs. Bennett has ever wanted. <laughs> Ever. Yeah, we talked about this in the beginning. She was, I mean, as soon as Bingley arrived, she was like, got to secure him for Jane. Yep. She's my eldest daughter. Got to marry her off to the hottest Actually, man. what she basically said was, there's an eligible man in town. I got five daughters. One of them's got to get him. Right. One of them got him. One of them got him. And Mary and Kitty immediately start like asking for things at Netherfield. Mary wants the library and Kitty begs her to throw balls every winter. What a personality show. Oh, yeah. It's like peak. Mary wants access to the library. Yeah. Kitty wants parties. Yep. Peak them. And Lydia doesn't know that they got engaged. I just realized Lydia's all the way up north. Yep. Not that I miss her or anything, but Back to Jane, the one that didn't disappoint Mrs. Bennett and Mr. Bennett. Yes. So Bingley starts coming every day to Longbourn. And so now Jane hardly has any time to hang out with Lizzie, except when Bingley and Jane are in separate rooms, separated by some sort of something or other. Each of them hangs out with Lizzie in turn. So Lizzie will hang out with either Bingley or Jane. And they're both just like talking about how much they love the other one. And I imagine and it's very cute. Which like I'm sure actually genuinely makes Lizzie happy because oh, yeah. it can be really annoying when your friends are in a really happy relationship and won't shut up about it. Mm -hmm. But when you care enough about the person, you're like, no, I genuinely want to hear about how happy you are all the time because you've been through shit. Yeah. And I'm happy that you're happy now. Also, I love, I just really love this Bingley and Lizzie friendship. Right? Now that we're nearing the end of the book, I can tell you that I like high key love Bingley. Like he is one of my faves. Obviously a very flawed character. He's just a little dumb. He's just a little dumb and he's a little impressionable. Yeah. But he's such a sweetheart and He's so enjoyable and so charming. I also, in the 2005 version in particular, a very cute guy plays him. So like, oh, I bet. You know. <laughs> oh, I'm ex so excited. Y'all, I am so excited for these movie episodes. So I don't know if we've said this before on the podcast, but we're not just reading the Jane Austen books. We are going to go into all the major adaptations as well. So once we finish reading this book, we're not even done with Pride and Prejudice for another little while. And we're going to move on to reading the other Jane Austen books eventually. But we got so much time. We have some really good plans for watching a lot of different adaptations of Pride and Prejudice. Mm -hmm. So you're going to hear Molly's thoughts on casting, on adaptations, on changes to the story, mm, on yes. uh, sets and costume design. I am so hype about this part. I'm so excited. I'm getting ahead of myself because we still have a few episodes left, but we have done such intensive and detailed work going over Jane Austen's beautiful words, but I think that Jane Austen's words also lend themselves to some of the greatest movie adaptations. And so I'm really excited to show you all these things. Also, like, I feel like everyone's talking on the internet right now about how now is a great time to watch, like, Regency romances. And I am just, like, I want to be there with you Oh, right yes. Now. You are so close, my dear. So close. You're so close. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have any, like obscure Pride and Prejudice adaptations that you like really love feel free to let us know about them and we'll see if we can squeeze them in to our schedule we're gonna do all the major ones so we're gonna do obviously 2005 and uh the 1990s version as well Colin Firth Keira Knightley so that Molly can understand their Same movie. different movies and then we're also gonna do I know for sure we're gonna do like Bridget Jones Diary Bride and Prejudice, the Lizzie Bennet Diaries. And, you know, we, we have a lot of cool stuff coming your way. We have a lot of content, guys. Bride and Prejudice and Zombies. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So get excited, basically. Back to the book that we haven't finished yet. Yes. Where were we? We have Lizzie and Bingley broing out together in, like, a very cute friendship. And also, obviously, Lizzie and Jane's friendship is also super cute. Yes. And Jane comes in to tell Lizzie, like, would you know that he just told me he didn't even know that I was in London when I was there. And that's why he didn't call on me. And Lizzie's like, oh, like, obviously she knew that. And then Jane says that she thinks it was Caroline's doing. And this was peak Lizzie. She said, I think it was Caroline's doing. We will probably be friendly again, but we're never going to be friends like we were. And Lizzie says, that is the most unforgiving speech that I have ever heard you utter. Good girl. We are all Lizzie in that moment. We're like, yes. finish her. And Jane's just like, I don't think I like her very much. Yep. And it's phenomenal. So she finally knows the truth of that situation. And then Jane asks Lizzie if she could believe that he actually really loved her all this time. And the only thing that kept him from her was the belief that she didn't love him back. And Lizzie is like, he made a little mistake. And she attributes it to his modesty. And Jane then launches into a panegyric, which is a speech of 
praise in favor of Bingley and how good he is. Also, note that Jane has been very understated even back when she, like, thought it was going to happen last year. She has been very understated in talking about her love for him. She's going on manifestos now, she like, is. about how much she loves him. It is so cute. Finally. Ugh. But also, like, now that she finally knows the truth about the fact that he didn't know she was in London, the fact that he really loved her the whole time and he thought that she didn't love him back, now she feels like she can give free reign to her emotions because... He loves her. Can I reiterate again? This is what Jane deserves. This is what Jane deserves. We love it. We love to see it. The thing is that Bingley didn't tell her that it was Darcy that told him that she didn't love him back. And Lizzie quietly feels very happy for this because she fears that that would cause Jane to like be prejudiced against him. It's in the title. It's in the title. I don't think Jane could really be prejudiced against anyone except maybe now Caroline Bingley. Well, if you think about it this way, she would be prejudiced against Darcy in the same way she could be prejudiced against Caroline Bingley for being shitty to her. Right. Like how we were. Exactly. (laughs) Because it sucked. And then Jane talks about how she only wishes Lizzie could be this happy and she wishes there was someone as good as Bingley for her. And Lizzie says she couldn't possibly be as happy as Jane even if she had 40 such men. But maybe in time... She'll meet with another Collins and she'll get married. Yikes. Yeah. Lizzie, I know she's joking, but Lizzie, gross. Just no. (laughs) But that's also really undervaluing herself because saying she'll meet with someone else who will throw himself at her and she'll marry him even if she doesn't love him. Lizzie's being a dramatic bitch right now because basically her thought is, I have the one love. I'll never love again like I love the one love. And the one love would never marry me because I rejected him and because he knows that my family's disgraceful. So she's going to settle. I'll just marry for money. Ugh. 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 Lizzie. She's being very dramatic. Hand on the forehead, the drama. Exactly. Then Mrs. Bennett is so excited. She just tells the world about Jane and Bingley. And now the Bennets are viewed as the luckiest family in the world. And that is the end of the chapter. <laughs> and that brings us to Becca's study questions. Woohoo! There are a lot today. So like, I'm excited to go into them. Yay. So first, we're going to start with Lizzie overthinking everything having to do with Darcy in these chapters and her sort of dramatic turn in these chapters. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you wanted to talk about how this differs from their Pemberley interactions, how this differs from their Rosings interactions, basically where they are at this point in their relationship. Well, I think it's hard because Lizzie was on vacation, right? When, When things kind of got very easy for them to like hang out and bro out, not bro out, but like fall in love, you know? Uh, same thing bro out (laughs) is that what they call falling in love nowadays broing out occasionally (laughs) I don't know like he was being so nice to the gardeners and they were but they were somewhere else they weren't by Lizzie's family and I think that that's important I think that Darcy one is not very good around crowds and the gardeners are very cool people so of course he's going to be cool with them two he's not very good around Mrs. Bennett because they are just a clash of the clans, I guess. They're like not, they do not mesh. They don't like each other. No. So that would make him very uncomfortable, I think. And when he's uncomfortable, he isn't good at interaction. Also, now that he's back in her family's sphere, they don't know that he gave all this money to secure their happiness and status. So he probably feels weird about that. He intentionally kept that a secret. Like he was like, Mr. Gardner, you take the credit for this, but I want to do it. Why? He didn't want them to feel indebted to him, I guess, because he knows that they don't like him. Basically, I think he just feels awkward. I don't think he's being mean on purpose or anything. Of course not. I think you're totally right on everything you said, but I also think there's a difference with Lizzie as well, because remember that it's been a while since Lizzie and Darcy have interacted in front of the Bennets, and Lizzie was a little different in Longbourn than she was in Rosings and Pemberley. Right, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, last time she was around her family, she hated Darcy. So he probably thinks that they think that she still does. He just, like, overall, I think that they both feel weird because their relationship has changed in a different context, but the people here don't know that. So it just makes them feel weird. Exactly. And they're both overanalyzing everything. We're getting it from Lizzie's perspective. But you know that Darcy's going home and writing like a long letter to Georgie being like, Dear Georgie, 
I think she still hates me. Yes. And Georgie's sitting there like being like, how is he this dumb? This is kind of like, so I, have you read Normal People by Sally Rooney? No, but it's like literally next on my list. So that book is so good. And what it does is it switches back and forth. Each chapter is from the other person's perspective. Okay. And I'm watching the Netflix, um, the Hulu show right now. And so far they haven't done a good job of showing that. But there was just a scene in the episode I watched yesterday, which I won't give any spoilers about, but where they showed it from Connell's perspective and it was one way. And then they showed it from Marianne's perspective and it was another way. And that's how you kind of get the sense of like why they both misinterpreted a situation. And I think that here we need this from Darcy perspective too because Lizzie's like why is he being so cold and like you know how he is Lizzie but she's like why is he being so cold and he's probably sitting there like why isn't she talking to me what but that exactly and we we all remember when Mr. Darcy looks cold and repressed he's usually just trying to figure out what to say yeah exactly because he's got resting bitch face and he's a disaster yeah yeah instead of getting more pride and prejudice from Darcy's perspective we are getting Twilight from Edward Cullen's perspective because that's what 2020 is. Ah, uh, yes, Midnight Sun. Never forget. Yep. I don't know if you were ever a Twihard. Oh, yes, I was. Were you Team Edward or Team Jacob? Team Jacob all the way. Actually, my favorite character was Seth Clearwater and I named Seth my- Seth Clearwater um, is like a great character. He's so good. I named my iPod after him. You know how you get to name your iPod? Oh my God, I forgot that we got to name like our when iPods. when you plug it in and it goes like Molly Burdick's Seth Clearwater. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. You're adorable. So we have another proposal. Graham, the sound effect. Do, 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 I don't think that's the sound effect, but I like it. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. We have another proposal. This one's a big one. Uh, let's start with what this means for the Bennets as a little bit of a precursor to this. Remember that this is where the book started. The truth universally acknowledged that, the, that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. And he found one. Yeah. I will also draw our attention to the Bennets were speedily pronounced to be the luckiest family in the world, though only a few weeks before when Lydia had first run away, they had been generally proved to be marked out for misfortune. So this has done like a real turnaround because that was a marriage one, that was scandalous, and two, that was not a man in possession of a good fortune. Now we've got the man in possession of a good fortune, who they have had their sights set on since the very beginning, finally marrying into their family and giving them status. And everyone, like, widely loves Bingley. Like, he's, nobody doesn't like him. So everyone's really happy for them, and this is good news for the Bennets. That's all totally correct. I want to add a little bit back to my... <clears throat> I haven't done this bit in a while, so let me just stretch out the economics of dating in the Austin era. Becca's memoir. <laughs> exactly. So in the economics of dating in the Austin memoir, remember that the girls need to marry for money. Now, one of them has secured a spouse so wealthy that pretty assuredly, the rest will likely not be destitute. Wow. He's that rich? He's like not going to support all of them, but like Jane is at least going to not starve, but like they have tied their family to another fortune now. Yeah. Because Lydia married horribly. They're losing some money on her. Exactly. For not just the reasons that Wickham sucks, but like economically, Lydia can do nothing for her family. Now, Jane can. I finally saw the adaptation of Little Women. Ah! Did you cry? The entire time. Yep. Same. I love that book. And that adaptation spoke to me so deeply so on good. an emotional level that like I need I need to watch it again. It's a whole thing. I can't watch it again because I cried so hard. I was like, I was. I thought I was going to get sick. I cried so hard watching My it. My friend Torrance and I went to go see it at BAM and we were sitting in the last row sobbing. Nobody else in this theater. There was like maybe one other group of people that was crying, but we were sobbing and we could not control ourselves. We were sobbing loudly. And people at the end of the movie, the people sitting in front of us turned around and were like, are you okay? <laughs> and... <laughs> And we were like still sitting there like <laughs> I just like my heart was just soaring the entire time. I saw it with my whole family. Everyone cried. It was just it was amazing. But one of the things Greta Gerwig wrote into it. So spoilers here for anyone who A hasn't read Little Women or B hasn't seen this adaptation of Little Women. Just a caveat, skip ahead like 15 seconds. But Amy gives that speech about how she's getting income for her family mm -hmm. by marrying rich. Similar vibe. Oh, I was thinking about that the whole time. I was like, this is like, well, we, we had this conversation. I was like, this is Jane Austen in America. Yeah, that's exactly that speech is the speech that I give 
like every episode of this podcast about economics of dating, how women need to marry for money. But Jane has brought in a hefty income to her family. Like the Bennetts are much better off as a family now because Jane married well. Like that kind of erases Lydia's horrible mistakes. So the panic that we've been feeling from Mrs. Bennett, all book, the panic flow has like calmed down now because it's likely now her daughters will not starve. Good. Good on Jane for doing that. A lot of the next part is breaking down what the Jingley marriage means. So we're going to go really into this. So now I want to talk about what it means for Bingley's character. I want your thoughts before I talk. Well, one, if he was still operating under Darcy's kind of she's not good enough, blah, 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 her family, blah, 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 blah. This means that he has gotten a little bit of a backbone and gone on and done the thing anyway because he loves her. Though, I do not think that Darcy is still saying that. I think that Darcy was probably like, go for it, dude. That's exactly how he probably said it, too. Yeah, he was probably sitting there like on the horse, sipping his tea on the horse together with his tea and he tapped Bingley on the shoulder because he's sitting behind him because obviously and he said hey go for it dude which I think therefore I still think that Bingley probably has grown a little bit of a spine because now he's talking for himself and like speaking up for himself and like what he wants but I think that this says something greater about the Bingley Darcy friendship squad over there and like what they believe about the Bennett family also I just I love Bingley Like, what a sweet boy. We stand. We stand. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think at this point in time, we can infer that Darcy's not quite as disapproving as he used to be of the match. For sure. We can infer he at least told Bingley I might have been wrong about her feelings. Oh, right, because Lizzie told him that, right? Yeah. Oh, good boy. I also think that even if Darcy changed his mind, it's likely that the sisters did not. Yes. So, first of all, another loss (gasps) for Caroline Bingley. Yeah. I forgot about them again. I keep forgetting... It's not that I forget about them. I just forget that they're related to Bingley. Oh, yeah, yeah, because they suck. And Bingley's great. They really suck. So that means that he's defying his sisters. So he has indeed grown a backbone. Exactly. That's what I'm saying is that your first comment on Bingley in the first episode (gasps) of this podcast. He needs 12 opinions. He needs 12 opinions. Now? He did this with his own opinion. This is his opinion. This is his choice. Oh, I'm so proud of him. You know what this is? Growth. Growth. (laughs) We are so good at culture. I feel so bad for our listeners because of the amount of times we quote memes to each other. We do. And we always are like, what is that? Yeah, well, uh, that's why Graham is here. He does the meme research. Because he's told us that one's from Insecure, which I am behind on. I have never watched, so I didn't know and would not have It's It's great. It's a great show. But I'm so proud of this boy. Yes. We should just be proud of our boy for standing up for what he really wants and for the woman he loves and getting up the courage to propose to her despite that not being what his family wants. Yeah. All very sweet. Next question. This marriage. Compare it to Lickham. And how does it affect Lickham? When you say Lickham, you mean Lydia Wickham, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> Lickham sucks. Yeah, they, they suck. This marriage, Jingli has done everything right. Bingley has done the courtship. He's gone to their house every day. He's won over the family. And then he proposed. And then he, you know, he just did everything right. And he's also wealthy. Whereas Wickham stole the daughter away when she wasn't even he didn't even have the balls to go to her when she was at Longbourn and even speak to her parents he ran off with her to go have sex in a motel and wasn't even going to marry her and then had to be paid a lot of money to marry her which from the outside people might then forgive like not everyone knows about the uh what's it called scandal premarital sex the premar nobody knows about the premarital sex but they also might not know that Wickham sucks because Darcy didn't tell them and Lizzie didn't tell them and Jane didn't tell them that Darcy sucks I meant that that oh, Wickham sucks oh boy that they didn't tell them <laughs> back to episode one yeah, that Bingley <laughs> I I think it's pretty clear uh people know that Wickham sucks now because he left a bunch of debts behind right right that's true that's true so people know that Wickham sucks but. Ultimately, they might not know about the scandal surrounding the marriage, and they might think, okay, she married this guy who has a lot of debts. No, nobody's going to like that marriage. I guess, ultimately, Lickham has done everything wrong, everything they could to shame their family, and then they left. They were just like, boop, bye. Bingley has done everything right, and Jingley is going to live at Netherfield and basically just bring honor to us all. I was thinking about Mulan this episode because I was like, do you want to stay for dinner? 
Do you want to stay forever? Do you want to stay forever? (laughs) Mrs. Bennett. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's all accurate. And I also think the other element to this that I'm saying now, because we've talked about it before, is the Charlotte Collins match Mm -hmm. versus the Lickham match versus the Jingley match. We have Charlotte and Collins doing all the mechanisms of marrying for money. We have Lydia and Wickham doing the exact opposite, marrying for lust and making terrible choices. And then you have Jane and Bingley, the first couple we've seen get engaged in this book. Marry for love. For love. love. And also, it's a sensible match. (gasps) They married for love. They did. It's the first couple we can look at and say objectively, they'll be happy. Okay, the tea. Lizzie and Jane both fell in love with rich guys like how convenient for them but like i want to see the jane austen book where someone falls in love with a poor guy that is an excellent point and one i was saving for sort of the end of the book but general problem with jane austen novels is the convenience that all the heroines happen to fall for rich guys yeah uh how coincidental how coincidental maybe it's time for someone to write a regency style novel but about the other way around. You mean the princess and the stable boy sort of scenario? Yeah. Interesting. Noted. All right. The next question I have is about Jane. How has her character changed? And this is also just free license to just gush about how Jane deserves this. She deserved this. (laughs) She has done a complete... 180 before she was so self-deprecating and like he couldn't love me like this whole time she's been like we're gonna be friends it's gonna be fine like ugh. because first she thought he hates me then she thought he seems perfectly indifferent to me like he's just that nice to everybody he's just nice he's just a nice guy I'm fine and then now she's like could you believe he loves me and then she's like I'm so happy she's just happy I'm just so excited that she's happy at last because Jane While she has been good this whole book, she is such a good person, she has not really been happy at all. Oh, no, not at all. She's never been happy. She's been, like, happy. Like She was happy when she was courted by Bingley the first time. Yes, she was so happy then. And then since then, she's kind of just been, like, there for everyone else during their problems. Yeah. Jane, now she gets to be happy. So back really early on, really early on, you do not remember this. We had a conversation where you thought that Jane could learn from Lizzie to be a bit more discerning of people. And I said, without spoiling anything, I think that Jane and Lizzie could learn from each other. Yeah, I remember that conversation. And now we see that Lizzie has learned that she is sometimes harsh and judgmental and prejudiced Mm -hmm. against people. But we also see Jane kind of acknowledging when people are shitty. Like Caroline Bingley. Like Caroline Bingley. And we also see Jane voicing her emotions pretty loudly. And it is one of the most consistent traits in our character since the beginning of the book that even if she's happy, she's going to be understated. Mm -hmm. And now she's not. She's letting herself. She's letting herself be. She's letting herself dislike people and she's letting herself love. And she's letting herself be happy and not feel guilty about it. Exactly. So I stand this journey for Jane. Me too. It's a phenomenal one. I know we're being really gushy this episode, guys. We need some happiness in our life. Quarantine is really hard. And like there's genuinely no love story that is purer and more heartwarming than Jingli. Yeah. Oh, man. On that note, the last question before our standbys is, I want to go back to the Daddy Bennett quote, the one that you thought was weird. Yeah. I want to like unpack it a little bit. Yeah, please, because it was kind of weird. So basically what Daddy Bennett is saying is it's pretty obvious that the two of them are alike in that they see the best in people and that they have this positive outlook on life and that You know, it will lead to the fact that, like, some people will take advantage of them in life, but overall they'll be happy. Yes. And that, I think, is a really nice sentiment of a lot of times in good literature, the positive peppy characters get knocked down. Mm -hmm. We actually get a scenario where they get a happy ending, and that's really nice. Yeah. The one caveat I'll add to it is that there are certain people in their family who they might have to pay for. Right. (laughs) Looking at Lickham. Uh, So... I I think that, like, this couple is pretty obviously the secondary love story of this book. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to acknowledge who they are, how they differ from our main protagonists, and what that means for their happiness, if that makes sense. Yeah. I will say I don't think that he needed to say that at that moment. He could have just been, like, happy for you, Jane. Love this guy. Very, very good choice. But he had to be Daddy Bennett and he had to say something a little bit snarky because that's just who he is. And, it is. you know, we stand that for him. We do. I think 
he didn't have to do it, but he did it. And um, it was weird, but it was it's kind of funny. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's not untrue. It's just basically like the world can be crap, but two people who genuinely don't see the world that way have found the sunniness with each other. Also, do you think he's a little bit jealous because he is seeing how happy a marriage can be? Maybe, but I, I mean, I think it's more like Daddy Bennett for his flaws loves his daughter. And he really does. wants her to be happy. He does love Jane. Not as much as he loves Lizzie. I think he does think that both Jane and Bingley are a little dopey. <laughs> yeah, because he's a hardened man. Exactly. But I think he acknowledges that this man is going to make his daughter really happy. And rich. And rich. And that is no small matter to him. Exactly. All right. Funniest quote. I picked one today. I know. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. You know what this is? Growth. Growth. So this is when Bingley and Darcy have left the dinner party on Tuesday and Mrs. Bennett is telling Jane about how Mrs. Long said that they'll soon see her at Netherfield and that makes Mrs. Bennett very happy and she says, do you know what I heard Mrs. Long say? Ah, Mrs. Bennett, we shall have her at Netherfield at last. She did indeed. I do think Mrs. Long is as good a creature as ever lived and her nieces are very pretty behaved girls and not at all handsome. I like them prodigiously. Ah, so Mrs. Bennett. Mrs. Bennett, like, does a full circle back to beginning of the book, Mrs. Bennett, and it's wonderful. I would like to take a moment to actually read the comparison to that quote at the beginning of the book. It's on the first page. No, it's not. Hang on. (laughs) (laughs) She says the thing about Mrs. Long and how she hates her. Anyway, I don't know if I'm going to find this quote, but basically, at the beginning of the book, she was like, I hate Mrs. Long, but that's where I get all my gossip. And then now she's like, I love Mrs. Long because her daughters are ugly. And she said that you're going to marry Bingley. So anyway, it's funny. Yep. It's it's just the joy with which she says her daughters are ugly. I like them prodigiously. She likes all ugly people because they're no competition to her daughters. Exactly. All right. Questions moving forward. You know, all right. Bingley and Jane settled. Maybe we'll have a wedding. Maybe that's where we'll see Mr. Darcy again. I'm still curious about will Lickham stay together because I don't, I mean, maybe they just stay together, but I, yeah, maybe they do, but I'm curious. I'm curious if we'll get to hear Caroline Bingley's reaction to this. Excellent. Who wins the chapters? Bingley. Jane. Jingley. I thought Jane won, but I I mean, I yeah, think I was just really excited about Bingley, but Jane Jane gets but Bingley gave her what she deserved and she got I what mean, she deserved. I mean, we could we could give it to Jingley if you want. Let's give this one to Jingley. Yeah. Jingley takes the cake. Mad congrats to the happy couple. It is so fun to read a pure payoff. We love it. In a rom-com book. Yeah. We love it to see it. This has been one of the most consistent things Molly has wanted in this book the entire time. Yeah. And you finally got it. Was it everything you dreamed of? It was more. He was dorkier than I could have imagined. Yeah. Okay, guys, that concludes this episode of Pod and Prejudice. And because I'm recording on the floor of a closet, my butt is so numb. (laughs) Nice. So we need to stop recording. But until next time, stay proper. Find yourself a Bingley. Pod and Prejudice is edited by Molly Burdick and audio produced by Graham Cook. Our beautiful show art is designed by Torrance Brown. To learn more about our show and our team, you can check out our website at podandprejudice.com. To keep up with the show, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pod and Prejudice. If you like what you hear, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash podandprejudice to see how you can support us, or just drop us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.